what I'm talking about. first keynote coming up. And I would like to welcome Angela Haas. Um, she is a professional inventor, says her, her job role, something where I would say this is a job title where I'm a little bit envious because it's just cool. And uh, she's with Creaholics in, in Bern. And I'm really looking forward to what secret ingredients might be there regarding design thinking facilitation. So let's start. Thank you. Thanks for the nice handover. And um, I'm very, very happy to be a part of the DT Camp 2020, especially with a nice welcome on the online platform. I think we have people from all over the world. And in my background, you see Bern. And um, I'd like to share my secret ingredients and we'll start sharing my screen. So great facilitation turns a group of people into a dream team. And the dream team is the base of great invention. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. I'm Angela Haas or Angela Haas. And um, I want to share with you my secret ingredients for facilitation that I gathered in the last, yeah, I think around 15 years. And so that you know who is there. I'll try to find out how my... <laughs> You have um, me, a professional inventor, and a human-centered design expert. And um, I started actually as a designer, very um, visual, and got more and more interested in um, the way we work on different levels. And that's the part I'd like to share with you, and also the, yeah, insights that I gained from facilitating big, large groups with hundreds of people like today, maybe not online, or like C-level management groups or whole projects. And I'd just jump into the first thing and the most important I'd like to give you along is you can't invent in isolation. So it's really nice that you all are here I heard a few thousand people and I'm really, really lucky. Um, Jan mentioned it in the intro that I'm working with Queerholic and Stefan said it too. We're sitting in Biel and with 60 professional inventors. And we all have different backgrounds from business to technology. So we have engineers, we have psychologists and the human part. And bringing all these things together is that what makes it possible to invent and to be successful. And we said, who's Creaholic? So a few words here. With these 60 people, we managed a 30 years of a history, in the meantime, even more, on different levels from products, services, and organizations. Thousand projects, maybe 350 clients, probably more in the meantime. And um, we have a lot of patents, patents families, 250, three own digital products, especially from the area of design thinking, 12 spin-offs. Those are companies that where we bring our own ideas to fly and into the market. And we have trained also in facilitation 7,000 people. So in all these things I'd like to bring together, and the question is, how does it work if you 60 people with different backgrounds or today in the design camp, design thinking camp? And it's as simple as yes and. So if we go back to today, wouldn't be have been of possible if when Stefan said, hey, we can't do it online, Jan would have said, yes, it's impossible. Uh, but yeah, it's 
not manageable. But because Jan said, yes, and we can manage it together and get more people on board, it's why we're together today. So also today, if there's something that's not working out 100%, always think in the yes and mood and see how you can turn uh, this is impossible to uh, how can we make it possible. And that brings me to the next thing. Facilitation is a leadership skill. A lot of people underestimate what facilitation means for a project, for a product, for the whole team. So one secret ingredient is to acknowledge how valuable facilitation is. And you saw my mountains in the background and you don't do exhibitions without a good guide either. So a facilitator is like your guide to the goal that helps the team align, find together and use all the potential. And I think a lot of the leaders today um, should put in more of the facilitation skills. And then there will be new disruptive inventions. And because it's a leadership skill, it's also about your personal development. So my next ingredient is if you're facilitating, if you're a leader, take a risk. If you want the team to take a risk. We always talk about uh, making and finding no, new ideas, big, great inventions. All of those people and groups and teams had to take a risk. So when you're facilitating, think about something new you want to try and then build it in so they, the group and the people you're facilitating with see, oh, okay, they're taking a risk too. And then that brings me to the, if you think you know. I have here two materials I picked out and it's, the question would be, which one of those swims? The truth is, you know nothing. Because depending on the context, the stone can fly and the cork is maybe hovering slowly around. So the thing what I'd like to share out of this is grow yourself with every project and interaction. Stay curious and start a journey with the group. And then somebody else maybe brings in that stones can fly. And that brings me to how can you have an environment where people openly speak and have maybe crazy ideas and say that stones fly and don't sink to the bottom of the water? It's be prepared for the unprepared. And there are a lot of different ways of preparing yourself. I think the most important is to be yourself and to settle within you and know what's the goal of the project workshop and have this in front of you so you can take the turns and different sides. And there are a lot of tools to get prepared and I just wanna blend in one, we developed like the facilitator canvas that is all the questions you have to ask before you're going into the in this case, maybe workshop, meeting, or a ritual if you work in an AHL setup. That brings me to the next secret ingredient, the flow. Do what's needed for the team. And what do I mean by that? A flow is something where the team forgets everything around them. The time, the maybe food or stuff like that. And a facilitator is not the moderator that is in front and is like always present. The facilitator is somebody that is in the background and enables everything that the group can be in the flow. That also means if your group is bored, help them to find more challenging questions. Or if they don't know what to do, they're lost, 
give structure and help them back into the flow. And if you're interested in the topic of flow, there's a cheese tank, Mihaly, who did all kinds of different, um, yeah, things about flow. So you can go deeper there. Now we talked a lot about your role. Very important thing are your participants, if it's a workshop or your group or team, your dream team is let the other ones shine because it's not all about you. So you don't need to take yourself too important. If the group is working well, don't intervene. So if they're in the flow, it's good taking a step back, staying present and letting the other ones shine and share. Now, not always everything works out very well. So the next question is about how to manage like crucial situations. And also there, I'd like to remind you of, it's not all about you. So the first thing in a crucial situation is step back and take like a look, what is happening? Is it a problem for myself? Is it a problem for the group? If it's a problem for yourself, you may also can just let go and continue and watch the situation. If it's crucial to the group, then also look, is it really a problem? Or is it just, I think it's a problem for the group. If it's not really a problem, just do small interactions and try to bring the group back on track. If it's a really big problem, it's very, very important to do something. And then it's your leadership stepping in and guiding and finding the next way. And that's what I'd like to go and hand over to number nine. Look beyond the obvious. And I'd like to, if you know all in front of the screens, invite you to also look beyond the obvious. What's around you? What's behind your screen? Be aware of the surroundings so that you're doing a facilitation, focus on yourself and your connection with you, on your um, opponent, on the team and the surrounding. What is happening in space? And sometimes a facilitator can change everything with holding the space and just being there. So if you look at all the nine things I said before and combine them, then when you look beyond the obvious, you can transform a caterpillar into a butterfly and a team or even the organization and yourself through facilitation. That brings me to the end with one more thing, maybe even the most important, take fun seriously. So thank you very much for listening and I'm really anxious to hear if there are questions and um, or comments and like to open up the room. And I'll leave the presentation so that I can see you guys. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, Angela. Um, I'm jumping in for Stefan because I heard he had some technical difficulties in the background, even though I see he's back and he's moving. Stefan, do you want to take on the um, um, live moderation again? Then can check the chat. No, you don't. Okay, you better don't. Then I have to do, do two things twice. Well, stepping out of the comfort zone. Here we are. Okay, first thing before, um, Angela, um, I asked you some questions from my side and also then from the participants. Um, there was one question um, about the reference to flow. Um, and 
I, I read this book years ago and it's it's unpronounceable. Mihai Chik Pen Hai or something like this. Is this the correct reference or were you referencing another flow author? No, it is the correct one. And I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. And I think somebody already posted it into the chat. Very good, very good. Okay, that's, that's great to hear. Okay, good. So then check. <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, so it, I would start with some, some questions from the um, um, attendees here uh, in mm -hmm. this little, little um, room. And then later on, I might also have some questions for you. Um, there was one first question um, and I have to check out from whom it came. Um, ah, yeah. It came from Hannah Lyons Tsai. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and she, she asked, what tips does Angela have for people moving into a design thinking facilitation role? Um, and then she also asked the second question to that. How can a novice start doing this and how can they overcome confidence challenges? The creative confidence discussion. Uh, yeah. for, in that case, for facilitators. What do you have to say for Hannah? I think the most important I'd like to give you is test, try out things. The, you can read so many, as many books as you like. Facilitation is really about experience. You have to try out and maybe start with um, co-facilitating with a um, colleague or something so that you can um, be present and don't have as much stress like a, a backup. And actually we in Creaholic, when we go to clients and have um, important projects, we normally co-facilitate. So I think that's something I'd like to give you along. The other thing is like, if you're just starting it and you're starting it in your bureau, it's really important to have people on board and explain also what is facilitation, that it's more enabling and not I'm doing all the work and I'm the, like the horse in front and pulling, that it's really about the team and working together and um, guiding through the process. Uh, that's interesting. Um, we, we, we always use at the HBI the term, the term shadow coach uh, in the D school. Um, there are often shadow coaches from the industry um, who, who come and, and, and learn in the program and uh, then they learn. And I think that's really one of the best things, uh, again, step out of the comfort zone um, and look what others are doing who have some experience. Would you be willing to, uh, if someone approached you for some shadow coaching some days, would you be willing to do that, Angela? <laughs> I'm asking you, you in front of I, 300 people. <laughs> if I'm honest, a lot of people ask. So um, yeah, ask, reach out, but I can't promise anything. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, what have I done? Uh, next question, <laughs> next question. Um, uh, oh, that, that's, that's related to that. Maybe I put that first. Um, someone asked, um, sorry that I, I don't know anymore who was it. Is it correct to say that behind every invention, there's a unique, no, sorry, that's the, the wrong one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, no, that was the one. How do you deal with facilitating groups where there's some concern about the effectiveness of workshops and, haven't, and which haven't been part of a design thinking process yet? So you have some, yeah, some, 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 some barriers to take there um, and some concerns in the beginning. How do you deal with that? Have you experienced it? I think it always depends on, on what time the problem uh, turns up. Is it in the beginning, like before it even started the workshop? Then it's about talking to the people and saying, hey, it's an experiment. How about you join for a day or maybe for the feedback round? It really depends on the role and who it is and how important it is that the person is on board. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe I add something to that. Um, I mean, from, from, from our experience, design thinking, um, I mean, it's since 15 years um, now, it has been promoted. I mean, it's in the world longer, we know that. However, since 15 years, um, it's, it's, it has become popular now. And there are many companies uh, where they say, we already tried design thing, it did not work, whatever the reasons. Um, so you might end up in such a situation. Oh, don't, this don't do this design thinking again. What would you do? Um, Maybe one thing I, I, I'd like to add, 
the question is always, you don't do design thinking because of design thinking. You do it because you want to reach something. So it's a lot about an invitation of what is our goals. And I normally don't even use the term design thinking if I do a workshop. So it's not like, oh, we will do a design thinking workshop. It's, no, we're going to work on, maybe it's an invention, maybe it's about innovation, um, depending what, what is needed. And when it's about value, then people learn very fast. Sometimes it's also the people, and that's the other level. The level is the one before. There, I have the feeling a lot changed in the last 15 years because now people know, oh, okay, you can do things, and it seems to be state of the art. And the other thing is you suddenly have somebody in your team that says, like, yeah, I'm here because I have to, but I don't want to be there. And that's a situation where it's good to start to pick up the person and take them along if they want to. So I see it always as their responsibility and build bridges to make it easier for them to participate. And if they're really totally against say, hey, how about you're already here, let's participate a few hours. And after that, you can decide if you want to stay or go. I really like what you said when you said, don't call this thing design thinking. I mean, we heard it over and over from many people who practice it for quite a while. Let's use the let's use the language that the organization already uses, um, but be careful to not mix up the meanings. Um, so 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 then you are more safe. And it brings also the next question up. It's it's uh, it falls perfectly to what you said. Um, Raya from Kuala Lumpur said, "How do you manage difficult team members who are not cooperating and also cause disharmony?" Um, this can also happen and for, for, for many reasons. Um, maybe they didn't like the process or maybe they had some prejudices before they came into the process. What, how do you deal with them in general? Do you have some tips for her? My biggest tip is to, first of all, not affect yourself with it. It's first of all, the problem of the member in the first moment and try to understand what is going on. Because sometimes it's, it's irritation, it's not understanding, not feeling safe. And look if you can help the person to feel safe enough to open up and trust the process. And from my feeling, that helps in almost all situations. It leaves a few people that really don't want to or really provocate, and there the next step comes in. Find out what is it. Is it something, maybe I'm a person that provocates something or triggers, then it's nice if I have a co-facilitator that can step in. And the other thing is like, be um, aware of what is happening and trying out different interventions step by step to solve the problem. And what helps me most is more to say, if I have somebody that's a little bit more complicated, I normally smile and think like, Oh, I'm really anxious to see how I'll solve this. So it's more for me like a, a challenge and not a, a problem. Challenge accepted. That's good. But uh, I, I want to um, uh, dive a little bit deeper here um, and want to ask you, I mean, you, you told us about two um, escalation uh, uh, steps. The first one is, okay, people might be a bit difficult, not cooperating and causing disharmony for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, but they are not adversaries yet, like really troublemakers, uh, where you would then bring in your co-facilitator, as you said, or something like this. What is a trick for the, for the small troublemaker, I would say, um, mm -hmm. that always works? Do you have something, a secret trick that you could share with us? It, because I don't know what the trouble is, but like maybe if you look at the uh, topic that's happening a lot, um, in offline meetings is having online devices. Like people are distracted because they're on their phones and maybe in their culture, it's not okay to say, okay, we lay down all phones. Then you can do a lot with your body language. Where do you stand? Where do you, who do you look at? Um, where do you build up connections? Like standing next to someone who's playing on their mobile phone will irritate them a lot and they probably will stop especially if you start looking at their screen. And this can be something where you didn't say a single word and you just did it very unconscious. And your group will learn stuff like that very, very fast without you being the teacher that says, oh, you shouldn't do this or you should do that. 
And the other thing is really building up connections with the people and understanding where they are. Okay. Okay, great. Angela, I'm totally overwhelmed by all the questions that come in here. You probably also can't follow them. How, that's how many they are, but we still have enough time. Um, okay. So, so that's really good. My, 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 my feeling is, is because many questions um, circle around facilitation. Um, some are very specific. How can one um, transform the investment management function at a pension fund organization? It's really hard to answer that in such a general um, discussion here. Um, but what comes up frequently here, what I can see is that people are really interested in your facilitation canvas. Um, many people ask for it. Can you yeah. go to the slide and uh, walk us through it a little bit? People want to know how it works. I would also be totally interested. Yeah, I hope um, that, uh, that you see enough because it uh, has a line over it. And you saw that I put a QR code in so you can download it. And I'll um, navigate there and right. wait. I, just give me a second. Of course. So We have another 15 minutes for Q&A and the session. So. No, That's no need um, to rush. And, and for everyone, while, while Angela is bringing that up, for everyone out there not getting his question answered because it's that many, um, you can, of course, um, reach her also in Fleep. Uh, Angela, can you uh, then after the session, please uh, share in the lobby your Fleep channel um, where you can be reached so that they might post, put it there and maybe you can share some useful links or something like this. So then we can keep the interaction going on. Yeah, I was looking if I could like open up the facilitator canvas as a total because that would make it a lot easier to show you. And so I think I should have it in a second. Yes. Good. And then go back. So now you should see the the canvas in. Um, is that working? Yes. Can you bring it up in full screen, please? So so even yeah. if you can't read all the details, maybe. Yes, that's good. Is it better this way? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe just in general, the facilitator canvas is like has different regions. Like the most important is the one on the left upper side where you see objective. And we, if you wouldn't fill out anything else, that would be the most important is what is it about? So the stake is why are you doing the workshop, the project? Then the second one is the impact. It is the emotional things the group takes away from the workshop. Is it an inspiring workshop? Is it maybe a workshop where you say it's giving you um, the energy to do something, to cope with a maybe crucial situation? And then the third part is what is coming out that you could imagine like a checklist. And if you have these three levels, then um, you have like everything in your backpack to um, manage crucial situations because you know, oh, okay, I have to stop here, I have to go on, um, what is important, if the time runs away, what can I leave away, because I still have the goal in mind. Then the rest of the upper part is about who are you inviting? And we like to think about who do we need to achieve the goal as roles, and then who are the participants taking in these roles? And some participants can have more roles, or maybe there's some, if we think in a workshop setting, that are only needed for like feedback sessions. And then on the um, right side, you have the setup. That's all the time, dates, materials. It's more a list for you to know that you think of everything that's important. Maybe also working agreements, if it's a workshop where everybody's standing, maybe you want to send the P in participants ahead that they shouldn't wear high shoes or maybe just comfortable shoes and comfortable clothes. In the middle, 
um, in the top middle, you have the goal and risks and challenges. Sometimes it helps if you from all your objective form like a single goal that you maybe put up in the workshop. And sometimes there are risks when you already know everybody hates design thinking, then maybe you could put that in there. And this is all like for the setup and it's for you. The canvas, you decide who you share what with. On the um, bottom part, you have um, the part with the building blocks. Gather everything that could work to help you achieve the goal. And from the building box, you then build the agenda and here work from high level to very detailed, up to minutes. And this also helps you that if there's a situation where you have to change something, you can look in your building blocks if there's something else you can use. And then the part that we call harvesting is the part that happens afterwards, the documentation and the outlook next steps. And this is also important to know ahead so you plan everything accordingly. As a facilitator, you don't necessarily have to document. It's your responsibility to be sure that it is being documented. So maybe that's also a role you can hand over to someone. So that be my mini introduction to the facilitator canvas. And I think the most important, try it out where it helps you use it. Give me feedback and um, we're constantly developing it further. Wow, good stuff. Good stuff you're developing. And now you're also in the hall of fame of the uh, canvas canvas uh, creators. That's very meta. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, all the canvases. I think that's that's the core of the canvas is you have everything on one page and at some point you realize that that's really helpful so we put that yeah. together for our courses. It's 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 um, it's 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 it's, it's actually uh, there there is actually a canvas canvas how to design canvases out there in the wild if you google it you'll find it it's really funny. Okay, I we still have, have to a... it ahead. I don't know. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, let's 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 use our time wisely here because um, there are still um, questions popping in. Let's see. Um, um, I, I would now pick because it's really many questions. I would like to pick now. Um, or would first of all um, ask all the participants who are new to design thinking um, and who start with it um to ask their questions maybe in fleep because we have that many experts um these days with us they might get, uh, be able to send you very useful links there have been written lots of medium articles on how to start with design thinking all these things um i think it's always worth using the time with someone experienced as angela is um to rather talk about more tricky challenges not the beginner challenges in that case because there's lots of material uh, out there already um, so let's, I, I will pick up another question, which I think is tricky. Yeah, let me, let me check that here. Um, <laughs> yes, the flow. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's interesting. This is really interesting. Um, from pages NA, uh, a funny participant who gave him a very nice nickname. Um, where do you believe the design thinking team should be in the company in terms of localization to make it more efficient and visible in marketing or in IT um, or anywhere else? And then uh, the participant also wrote something uh, that is not visible or has a, pla a bad place in the company uh, will fail politically. Do you have any experience with that? What, what would you mm -hmm. answer pages and a yeah, thank you for the question. I think it's a often discussed question in big companies. And from my experience, the most important is where is their energy? So I have seen design thinking teams that work very well, that come from IT, that come from marketing, that are coming from the product development. So I think it's a lot about who is it starting? It then starts like a grassroots and then the team grows bigger. So I don't think there's a like a best place for design thinking. I think it's where are people that actually 
can foster it and that believe in it because it's more about people than about the organizational box you're in. And that brings me up to the next thing. I think it's very, very important to network because often in big companies, it's like, oh, should it be in IT? Then that's the right one. And the one in marketing is wrong. Like connect yourself. If the other people try to spread and try to be like cross, uh, yeah, cross silo. And um, for my um, experience, it's a little bit tricky if you start from HR because there a lot of people already have um, prejudice against oh workshops and feeling well. So sometimes if you're from IT and then you do crazy warm ups, that's a nice contrast. So I always think it's important to say which language works best in your organization and get stakeholders. If you have a um, organization with a lot of different management levels, try to find people in the top management that have energy for this and um, take them along and keep them in, in loops or maybe in feedback sessions because they open the doors. Thank you, Angela, for this, for this um, very, I would say, short and concise first answer of this crazy big question, um, uh, which could fill actually the two whole days of this bar camp. Um, so um, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, however, um, Gerhard Fau from IBM um, might also have something to say about that uh, in the next keynote. Um, and also for everyone who deals with these questions, um, it's really good to look just in the internet, um, look for the IBM Enterprise Design Thinking Program, what they did. Also, uh, the company Intuit did great things. Many others as well. Um, they, they just come to mind because um, I researched them uh, quite a bit. Um, yeah, and they, they, there are many people from these organizations which have written lots of long blog posts on the whole topic. So it's really worth checking that out. Yep. Um, let's go to the next question. Oh, by the way, Page and A was uh, real name is Nicolas Paget. It looks like. <laughs> I hope I pronounced it right. Okay, so um, we still have another five minutes. So let's take a last question here. Um, and sorry for everyone whose question I missed, just copy and paste your question and take it over to Fleep later on. Um, uh, 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 mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, there's so much things going on here. Okay, there's one thing that's, that's interesting, actually, I think, um, because we are in, in Germany, uh, we have lots of engineering driven cultures and organizations. And um, it's always about the technology. Um, and we always want to put the user first, and then we turn the whole stage gate process around and we first do some customer discovery, then we fake something in lean startup mode with creating business models. And only then we build the technology if all that worked, which totally blows engineers minds. Yeah, um, so <laughs> along these lines, I think this question is really interesting that Rock Cleo post um, and, and he or she asked, should the output of design thinking be technology based? A very plain and simple question. Um, and I, I would say many engineers would ask that question. If they would come up to you, what, what would you say? Should the output of design thinking be technology based? I think the, the answer is easy. It can be technology based. It's not it should be. It is something that is a possible way. And like in, in the company where I'm uh, stated in Creaholic, we have a lot of engineers and a lot of our innovation is actually technology based. And it's always the, the playing together of the human needs, the desirability, the technology and the feasibility. And if you have all three in and manage the core, then it's very cool. It's okay. just not necessarily needs to have technology. Great. Thank you for that. I think we cannot repeat that enough uh, because this question comes up and up since 15 years. <laughs> so <laughs> let's answer it again and again. I guess we also need some patience. Um, and along these lines, uh, what Iona uh, Dival-Lotzach 
uh, I hope I pronounce this pronounce it right again um, asks is really interesting because we are nearing the end of this uh, mm -hmm. keynote and she asks a very personal question she asks say Angela how do you avoid too much pressure on yourself and how do you keep your own balance in all of this that's a good, good question. I think I'm still figuring out. I'm <laughs> trying different things. And um, yeah, I think it's a lot about keeping your spirit up, probably saying no. I can't, I don't always manage that part. And uh, saying yes to the things that give you energy, because I don't think it's about how many hours you work. It's about, is it something that pulls energy or gives you energy? And if and I'm working on keeping the balance between those two things. Do you have any mindfulness practice, life hack or something like this, which is very on vogue these days? <laughs> <laughs> of course, everybody has theirs. Um, if you don't want, you don't have to share. <laughs> no, I mean, it's called like centering. It's like you, you sit up straight and then you inhale. And then you kind of focus also on your intention. And it's a practice out of leadership embodiment where it's about aligning your whole body to your intention. And I like that a lot because it, it's not only screen based. So it's, uh, it's about bringing your brain and your body together. Great, great. Okay. So Angela, thank you very much. Um, for yeah, these very insightful learnings that you've accumulated over the years um, and that you shared with us um, here in the first keynote of the DT Barcamp 2020. Um, I want to announce a little thing or, or say a little thing um, because some people are asking here in the chat. Um, someone wrote the lobby channel is full. Yes, unfortunately, that's one of the things of our prototype. Um, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, which are too long to, 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 to name them here, we did not decide for Slack um, as our chat tool, and we used Fleep. Um, but it was not totally transparent that Fleep, unfortunately, can host only 700 people or 750 people in one channel, which meant or which means that we had to split the lobby channel. So there's a lobby channel one and a lobby channel two. Um, we will link them during the day um, on the home page so that you can also access the other one. However, you should also be able to figure it out in Fleep and find it. But this is something I would like to mention here um, at this point in time. So we have subgroups who can um, um, chat with each other, which will also be fine. That's part of our improvisation here. Sorry, everyone. We are learning. Next year, we will do better. We will, we will double check all these things. And with that, I would say, Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, everyone, for listening and coming in and putting in these very interesting questions. Um, please put them up in Fleep again, and we try over the days to answer them. Cool. Bye bye, Thank everyone. You. It was a pleasure. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> bye bye. Bye to Switzerland. Bye bye, Angela. Bye, Jan. Thank you.